It's so good to see everyone. Good mor- or good morning, no, good evening, and welcome in. It's good to be back home. We had a terrific time on vacay, but we are so glad to be back and see our church family. Looking forward to our Bible study together tonight. We are in 1 Kings 5. It seems like it's taken us a little while. We've had some different events going on on Wednesdays. and So here we are in 1 Kings 5. Please turn there, if you will, if you want to be refreshing a little bit during our study when you get bored by several things that are falling out of my mouth. You might review verse 12. Okay, it's going to be our memory verse for tonight. 1 Kings chapter 5 and verse 12. I hope you were born with a handy gene. I think I've told you a number of times, I wasn't really born with that. And uh, it's a really sad thing if you're not, but I hope you have it, and, and that's a great thing if you do. A lot of people born with a handy gene, a lot of people are not. If you're not born with a handy gene, as I you need to rely heavily on those with expertise. Most of you know, and, and I don't know if you care, but <laughs> uh, we're still involved in our deck project at home. We're getting closer <laughs> all the time. But uh, not having that handy gene, I've had to rely heavily on those who are in the know. Uh, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos, and it's not that difficult. It's just the time, and you know, you, you make a few mistakes as you get going. Well. I've had to learn these things along the way. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that perhaps Solomon wasn't born with a handy gene. I don't know that or not. But what we do know from Scripture is there is no indication he's been involved in any building project before he assumes the throne. And we're going to find next week in chapter 6, he's been sitting for four years on the throne when construction of the Lord's temple begins. He's going to build his own magnificent palace also. But He needs to rely on those who are in the know and who understand these matters that perhaps he hasn't been involved in before. So that's where we find ourselves in chapter 5. Please follow along with me, beginning in verse 1. Now, Hiram, I would ask who he is, but we're told. King of Tyre. Okay, where's Tyre? (laughs) Because we're not told there. Huh? It is in Phoenicia. Very good. Super. Okay, that's right, Roy. So, uh, if you will look on this map, I know it's not the most beautiful of all maps that I've, I've ever displayed, but I like this one because it's one of the rare ones to be able to find all of the locations that we need for tonight in one place. So, I hope you like the map that's hand-drawn by somebody, not yours truly. Uh, this is a, a map that fits this section, chapters 5 through 8, and I know there is no label on the star. Well, what do you think the star would be in municipality? Very good. The capital, which is Jerusalem. Good. You see Joppa on the map. We're going to talk about that this evening. Tyre is where we need to be. Lebanon, not Lebanon, but Lebanon is going to be quite significant. Uh, Gibal or Gibal, also known as the ancient place of Byblos, okay, or Biblia. We know that too. Might get a word or two from that one, huh? Bible and biblical. Uh, We're not going to deal with the Lebohamath up to the northeast. But these places we are going to right here, and you're probably familiar, that first uh, darkened spot is what geographical body of water? As we head north from the pointer. First one is the Dead Sea. What's the inlet? What feeds it? Jordan River, okay. And the Jordan River comes from what freshwater sea Yeah, Sea of Galilee, which is one of those misnomers. It's a lake. (laughs) It's a freshwater lake. But nevertheless, it's a sea, Uh, the Sea of Galilee. Very good. And so that's our our area. We have our boundary, even though those aren't labeled, just to keep in mind. So the west side of that Jordan River Valley. So I asked, where is Tyre? And it was so correctly responded to by Roy. That is in Phoenicia, uh, which is not uh, written up there. But Tyre is a city that a major city, by the way, that is found in Phoenicia, which is the, the country. That's the nation. And as you might be able to guess, the Phoenicians are not what? They're not what kind of people? Okay. <laughs> At times, unfortunately, that's true. They are not Jews, right? These are Gentile people, and so this is a Gentile ruler. And I just find that a little bit interesting for what it is that we're going to be discussing in 1 Kings Tonight. So I'll leave that map up there as we're going through some of this. It might help to visualize some of the geography. He did. Yeah, we're going to find that. So the, the king... 
Okay, interesting. Oh, hmm, that is fascinating. Uh, so verse 1, now Hiram, king of Tyre, and we know where that's located now, sent his servants to Solomon. Where do you think Solomon's hanging out? Jerusalem. He's at the star that's unnamed, right? And I know we don't have a, a legend up here, but we're looking roughly about 80 miles, basically due south from Tyre. So he sends uh, maybe for some scale from here to about Branson, all right? They're really not that far away. <laughs> but back then when travel so much harder, it would seem a lot farther away than what it does to us now. So Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, Roy. For Hiram had always, had always loved David. Now these are, are two people of different nationalities. Uh, they govern different nations, but they have a great relationship together. And I think there's probably a reason for that. Keep your spot in our text of 1 Kings 5. And let's turn backward to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy 20. Now this is some uh, in the midst of a, a whole bunch of instruction that's being tossed out. And in Deuteronomy 20, this is the instruction through Moses that God gives to his people concerning warfare, and it's just a sliver of it. Verse 10, Deuteronomy 20. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. I mean, these are like Israel's enemies. And so he's saying, if possible, have peace with people and, and don't go to war. That's better off. I, I love the statement. I, I don't want anyone to tell you. I'm not a pacifist, okay? I'm, I'm not looking at it from that perspective. But in war, to some degree, everybody loses. <laughs> uh, there are tremendous losses all the way around. So he says, just avoid this altogether. Peace is better than war and conflict. When you draw near to a city, even an enemy, to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. If it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, but it makes war against you, then you shall besiege it or, or go to war. As we're going to find this evening, there's a time to fight. There's a time for war. He's not saying be pacifists, okay? But at the same time, don't be those who are constantly seeking conflict. And especially this is going to be important for Israel's leaders. And I think you see this real positive, even though David's already passed away and he's gone on to his reward, that he was a really good ruler for the most part. He had his blunders as his son Solomon is going to demonstrate as well, and as every human king who's ever lived. But overall, he was a great king, and part of this was he was an excellent diplomat. He could build relations with those around him, even though he was involved in a terrific amount of war. So, king of Tyre, Hiram, sends his servants to Solomon because he hears that he's been anointed king in place of his father. And Hiram had a great relationship with David. He always loved him. So, verse 2, Solomon sent to Hiram, saying... So he sends this information back to him. You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. And I think this might be a really polite and respectful way of saying what happened with dad and why he couldn't build a temple. Do we find any other information about this? This is true what he speaks Dad couldn't build the temple because of the wars which were fought against him on every side. It sounds a little passive, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that, that's true. Those wars were being fought against him, but he was also involved in waging a lot of wars. Uh, let's turn back to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and put it over here. 1 Chronicles 28. And if you want to keep a mark in this general area, we don't normally do this with our textual studies but this spot here is kind of a parallel to this, and so we'll be flick, flipping back and forth to this general area. So if you're able to put an electronic or a, or a tangible bookmark, it might help you in that spot. So uh, First Kings, or I'm sorry, First Chronicles, I mentioned, chapter 28, verses 2 and 3. Then King David, back during his lifespan still, rose to his feet, and he said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God, and I made preparations for building. It's a beautiful thing to have a heart for God, 
We know that David possesses that. Old Testament, New Testament. Who else do you find? A man after God's own heart. That's true of David. When you're a person who has a heart for God, there are things that come into your heart that you want to do for God. That's a good thing also. I think we learned a great lesson from this. You have a man with a great heart, one that chases after God's own, and you have things that, that come into this guy's heart and he wants to do for the Lord with very good intentions. And notice what he speaks here, though, in, in verse 3. I made preparation. I was ready to go through with it. But God said to me, a man with a good heart for God, wanting to do great things for him, who has things that come into his heart that he wants to perform for God. But, he says, being a man of God, I always listen to God. What does he want me to do? Not everything that enters into our heart that we think might be a good thing for God necessarily should be done for God. <laughs> we need to listen to what he wants done. And so David does that. David says, or he says, uh, God spoke to me, you may not build a house for my name. Why not? He's a great guy, wanting to do a tremendous thing. He explains, for you are a man of war and, two reasons here, you are a man of war and you have shed blood. Okay, so I have a question for you here. Do you think Solomon's ever going to fight anything in all of his lifetime? Do you think he'll ever be involved in a, a battle, any kind of skirmish? Do you think he'll ever shed any blood? We've already seen a lot of blood being shed on, on Solomon's wife. Well, why does he get to build a temple and David doesn't? You, David, are a man of war and you've shed blood. Well, doesn't that pretty much describe any king of any time? I think probably so. But let's look at Exodus chapter 15. First of all, let's consider, is it a derogatory thought to be called a man of war? Is that a bad thing? I hope not too, Justin. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. What are we told about God in this place? The Lord, what is he? He's a warrior, and I have in my translation, this is the ESV here, of course the meanings are the same. The Lord is a man of war. You ever heard that? That sounds like David. He's a man after God's own heart, whenever he's a man of war, isn't he? The Lord is a man of war, the Lord, Yahweh, self uh, the self-existing sovereign ruler over all is his name. But in addition to being known as a man of war, God is also known as what kind of ruler? We've covered this several times, this is a review here. Isaiah 9-6, the prophecy of the Christ child, for unto us a child is born unto us, a son is given, and his name will be called Mighty God, or we often say God Almighty. That's what that means. We realize who Jesus is in the flesh? God in the fullness of his power and, and, and his, his glory granted in concealed form. Almighty God in human form. His name should be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And what relative, wonderful counselor are left out, and what relative to ruler? Prince of peace. It's such a beautiful balance between the two. God is love. God is also light. God is a man of war, but he's also a prince of peace. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is what two things? L's. Okay. And he judges and he makes war. Good. And what else are we told? He's a LL. Lion. And he's a lamb. The, the balance. He's God and he's man. You know, there are all of these that fit in with Jesus. Now, I want to draw your attention to this thought and we'll move on. But I, I mentioned this a moment ago. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. There is a time for every purpose under heaven. And then there's this big, long list, a time to love, a time to hate, a time to cry, a time to smile. And, and you go through all of this, and you get to the bottom, the very last thing that's mentioned in verse 8. There's a time for war, but there's also a time for peace. I just say all that to say this. 
as we're being reminded in 1 Kings 5 by our new king, the third in charge over Israel, the second in the Davidic dynasty, he makes this mention, my dad couldn't be king because of the wars which were fought against him on every side. It's stated elsewhere because he was a man of war and because he shed blood. Question, has Jesus ever been involved in war? Yeah, I mean, okay, in bodily form, like, like us, like in his 33 and a half years, okay, maybe not that, okay? But throughout the history of the Old Testament, I can prove it, oh, so many times over, and how, how many others that we don't have record of. Has Jesus ever been involved in the shedding of blood? Now, 33 and a half year, no. Outside of that, oh man, we could point out uh, the destroyer, quote unquote, Back in the book of, of Exodus, we often refer to that creature as the death angel, which is never called that in the Bible. Uh, we do have reference, though, to the destroyer being the Lord or Yahweh himself. How many were killed on that night all alone? The uh, Assyrian soldiers, what was 186,000, I think that's right, give or take, uh, in a single night. Lots of bloodshed, lots of war. So why does he get to be the one who establishes and builds the New Testament temple and reigns as king when he's a man of war, directly stated, and has shed blood left and right? David does the same thing and he can't. What's the difference, Marty? There you go. There's always justice when Jesus does it. Uh, it's self-motivation. It's selfishness. It's sinful when David sheds blood. I think you can probably make the case also with some of his wars, maybe uh, uh, getting a little antsy in a few of the things. Maybe some lives are lost that, that don't need to be. So there are lots of people for whom David is responsible in their, in their deaths and their, their blood being shed. And of course the census and all the, the people who die from that. There are lot, the, so for these reasons, he can't build the temple back in our text. And Solomon reiterates this to us, even though this isn't new information. He says, because of those wars fought against him on every side. Verse 4, but now the Lord my God, back in 1 Kings 5, but now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There's a difference. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. Peace. And I intend to be a ruler of peace, even though he shed blood too. And there will be some conflict along the way. And behold, I propose the same thing my dad wanted to do, to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne, in your place, he shall build the house for my name. So why does Solomon get to do it? Again, this is review to us, but why does Solomon get to build the house daddy doesn't? Implied in the former, what do we know about the latter? What's, what's Solomon's name mean again? Very similar to, yeah, Shalom or Salem, if you like the ending of Jerusalem. Peace. Right? His name means, he's called that for a reason. He's a, a peaceful person. He's going to be a peaceful ruler. And he gets to build God's house. Now we've seen all of this in, in typification. I can't wait till we... Pretty soon. I think it's going to be next year, Lord willing, maybe even have a theme on this next year uh, on the types of Jesus found throughout the Bible. Powerful stuff. And it's just the people. I hope the year after that to do the types of Jesus from objects in the Bible. Inanimate objects. That's the really fun stuff right there. We need to do the people first. And Solomon is one of these. He typifies Jesus as much as you can in human form in every way. Bless you. He is a ruler of peace, and God says, he's my, my son whom I'm choosing. Of course, you have the only begotten in Christ, the, the only son. And he builds the first uh, permanent, quote unquote, the worship structure called the temple for God's people. And we find out in the New Testament, Jesus, of all things, he could have been. What's, what's his background as far as vocation goes? obviously before being a preacher and savior of the universe. What's the preparatory work? Carpenter. Yeah, he knows how to build, right? Which is perfect, because he needs to build something for God, too. He's going to build a house, but it's a different kind. It's a spiritual edifice. He is a prince 
of peace, even though in a sense he's also a man of war. He knows the time to do it and the time not to do it, always seeks out peace. And he's going to construct this spiritual edifice. He's the perfect guy for the job. So what lessons can we draw? Uh, Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Keeping your spot in our Old Testament location too. Hebrews 12, we are encouraged this as God's temple and pieces of it today. Hebrews 12, verse 14, we are to pursue, run after, what good quality? Peace and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace with all people. That's true of you and me. We need to be at peace among ourselves. But as much as I can help it, I also need to be at peace with people on the outside and, and seek to have that relationship. It's always better than conflict, division, strife, war. Always a better option. Without which no one will see the Lord. And that's because it's, it's the Lord's character. He is a peaceful entity. He seeks to make peace. Now don't misunderstand, he's not a pacifist. And, and if push comes to shove, he'll get involved in conflict. He'll fight the battle, and in the end, he's going to wipe the earth clean. He'll do that kind of thing. It's just not what he wants. And it should be not what we want as his temple that he's constructed also. We always seek peace above all else, but we recognize there's a time for everything, and, and we'll fight the good fight of, of faith. We'll contend earnestly for the faith if we need to, but we want peace with those who are on the inside. We want peace with those who are on the outside. We can't see God, meaning we can't live with him, the Prince of Peace, unless we've demonstrated that in our own lives, Roy. Strange. Strange. I love your word, ironic. It is ironic. That's not what you would expect, is it? But that's, that's what we often see. All right, one other one, and we'll move on with our passage. Uh, Romans chapter 12, making a little bit of application. Romans 12. And we'll start about in verse 16. Romans 12, 16. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of, of all men. Listen to this. If it is possible, live at peace or peaceably... With all people, as much as it lies within you, recognizing, look, there is a time for everything. <laughs> and, and if sometimes we're given no other option but to be involved in conflict, you have to be prepared for that. It's not what you want. It's not what you instigate. So if possible, live peaceably with all people. Don't repay evil for evil for, with anyone. Why? What are we trying to accomplish here? Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What's the attempt here? What's the mission in Romans 12, and especially the latter portion? Peace, okay, true. Very good, and why? Excellent, that's what Jesus said, that's what Jesus lived, okay? And we found in in Hebrews 12, well, first of all, it's imperative for us to be saved, because... A person with a heart after God listens to, we see that in David's life, listens to what God says. And if needed, amends his or her ways. So if I'm having a struggle with with living peaceably with people, then that's something I have to address to be right with God. Okay? But in Romans 12, we're trying to overcome evil with good. There's the mentioning of heaping coals of fire, hot coals on, on top of somebody's head. We're trying to wake them up. And these attempts at at peace give us the opportunity to find peace with others and help them find peace with God. And that's really what we're trying to to do. Now, I want you to compare this as we've made those applications, going back to the Old Testament teaching now in our fifth chapter of 1 Kings. Verse 5, Behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. And the Lord spoke to my father David saying, You can't do it. You're a person of conflict. You've instigated that. You've shed innocent blood. But I'm going to choose my son, who so also happens to be your son, whom I will set 
on your throne in your place, and he shall build the house for my name. And here's why. A person of peace is needed to build the house of God. Now think about that as we take that principle and we utilize it 3,000 years later. What does that mean for us right here? What are we trying to do? First of all, we want to see God, that is, live with him ourselves one day. But also, we're trying to construct the spiritual edifice of our God. We're trying to build up the church of Christ. To do that, what kind of people in charge does it take? <laughs> but peaceful individuals, those who seek peace. If we're divisive amongst ourselves... If we seek conflict constantly with those on the outside, there's no chance to construct God's house. All there's going to be is deconstruction or demolition to the beautiful facility of our Lord. It takes a peaceful person, one who seeks it out, to build up the house of God. And that's why Solomon is chosen instead of David. Verse 6, Now therefore command, and this is still Solomon in case you're getting lost a little bit, Hiram, king of Tyre, originally sends uh, a delegation 80 miles down to the south where the star is found in Jerusalem to talk to Solomon and his people. Solomon sends people back up and he's making request of the king of Tyre. And here's the request, verse 6. Now therefore, Solomon asks, command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon. And my servants will be with your servants and I will pay... You wages for your servants according to whatever you say. Money's not an issue. Things are going really well in the Israelite economy. Basically, he's told them, name your price and I will pay it. I just have to have your cedars. <laughs> now, why do you think he, he wants his cedars for this construction project? We've encountered these a time or two. What's true of cedar wood in building? It won't rot. It's beautiful. I'm sorry, what? Okay, and that's why, right? The big part or helps anyway. Yeah, and not to mention the sense, quite pleasant also. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just absolutely terrific. It's, it's super sturdy. It's, it's beautiful, okay? You're not going to worry about as, as quick of deterioration. He says, I have to have your cedars. Notice that's from the forest of Lebanon. And that's a region that's, that's basically where Tyre is, is found, maybe just a little bit. Uh, to the north and, and somewhat to the east also. So, just name your price. Uh, I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll pay for whatever the wages are. No big deal. Four, he gives a compliment. That's wise. You know there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. And uh, a lot of times you'll find uh, Tyre and Sidon mentioned together they're right beside each other so you you guys from up here what he's saying in this area oh man it's a skill to cut timber if there's anything i've learned over the last month and i don't know if i learned it but i've relearned it it takes skill to cut wood exactly the way you want to i can't imagine having to cut timber accurately and pieces of wood to perfectly fit in without power tools uh, I've used, a, I, I never had one before, but for this deck project, I, I purchased a miter saw. And, oh man, the angle thing on that is, is phenomenal. Easy peasy. But not to have that, uh, not to have your speed square. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, they had their own stuff, I'm sure, like these. It, it's called it something different. But, but seriously, I mean, you look back in these ancient times and, and these magnificent worship facilities, whether for God or for uh, non-living gods and goddesses, that were constructed, of course, the pyramids of Egypt in the winter and, and summer solstices and the way the sun perfectly angles into the inner chambers. and hit, I mean, it's just, it's nothing short of remarkable. The hanging gardens of, of Babylon, absolutely incredible. He says, we need people with skill. Now, remember, we have no indication that Solomon has any background in construction work at all. And he's going to be involved certainly in one of if the most fabulous temple construction to date, even though as far as we can tell, he knows nothing about this kind of stuff. How could anyone who knows little to nothing potentially about this kind of project 
be so successful in the endeavor? You don't have to know how to do everything yourself, do you? God has not created one human being outside of one who could have the ability to do every single possible thing on planet Earth. He's given us all different abilities for a reason, and that's where his wisdom comes in. So much of wisdom is not, oh, I know everything, and I know how to do everything. A big part of wisdom is, is having the willingness to admit what you don't know, and that actually can be a real strength for you. And I think that's a real strength for Solomon. His humility is one of his greatest strengths. Uh, he mentions to God in, in that prayer, I'm like a little kid for this task. And how many kings, and, or in our case, you know, potential presidents, do you know would stand up and say, I don't have a clue how to do that, but I will get the right people. <laughs> I mean, really, that, that's a lot of wisdom that's speaking. So he says, I'm going to get the people who I know have the skill, and you know, king, who have the skill to cut timber like nobody's business. I'm getting the Sidonians. I'm going to contract this out to them. So it was when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord. And that's all caps because that's Yahweh, the covenantal name for God. He said, Blessed be Yahweh this day, for he has given David a wise son over this great people. I would be fascinated to know if, if this Hiram was a servant of, of God himself. He speaks awfully highly of him, praises his name, he praises the leader, and now new leader, of God's people, he praises the nation of Israel itself, uh, maybe he does have some connection to God. Uh, keep your spot here, I hope you have that bookmark, turn over, it's not 1 Chronicles 28 where we were, but it's really close, it's 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 2, and if you're like I am, it's almost on the same page, I think the next one. 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 7, we're given just a, a little bit more information. So now he says, send me, this is still Solomon speaking, a man skilled to work in the precious metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and purple, crimson, and blue fabrics, trained also in engraving, so you have to know a few things to get this job, <laughs> to, to be with the skilled workers who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David, my father, provided. So in this request, and this is something that's not found in the other text, uh, he not only asks for help, but as well he asks really for a leader to be over this project who's the expert of all experts in this. He has a lot of people with talent, but nobody quite on the level of the Sidonians to work with wood, and it sounds like right here probably also precious metals and then beautiful fabrics too. Okay, so 1 Kings 5 Verse 7, Hiram has, has just praised the Lord. You know, maybe he has some connection to God. Maybe David has some part. Perhaps the guy with a heart after the Lord's has, has converted this guy over. Verse 8, then Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent me, and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and cypress logs. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon... Okay, so that's up here uh, to the north. Again, you're about 80, maybe as much as about 100 miles to the north and maybe even a little northeast in Lebanon. He says, my servants will bring them down from Lebanon to the sea. And that's going to be here on the west. What's the big one over here? That's the Mediterranean Sea. And this is a, a good old way of doing things right here. We don't do this kind of thing much anymore. I will float them down to you. <laughs> I will float them in rafts by sea to the place you indicate to me, and I'll have them broken apart there. So it's going to be most efficient to keep them intact, to get them in the sea, to float them down, but once they come ashore, then we're going to split them, get them into the smaller pieces that are, are going to be used, or chunks anyway. Then you can take them away. And here's my end of it. You said anything I want, here's what I would like. You shall fulfill my desire by giving food. For my household. The grain in this area, of course, the fertile uh, valley and plain uh, over there. Some of it's pretty hilly and rough, but there's some really good growing area also is well known. I want some of the grain that comes out of your location. So this is the setup that is made. Look back in this parallel of 2 Chronicles 2. 
This time in verse 16, he says, I'm going to send them down to the place that you specify. Well, verse 16 of 2 Chronicles, I say Corinthians, I meant Chronicles too. It says, and we will cut whatever timber you need from Lebanon, so Hiram's doing this speaking, and bring it to you in rafts by sea to Joppa. Okay, so that's the place that's identified so that you then may take it up to Jerusalem. And that's where Joppa comes into the conversation. Uh, again, you're looking at roughly 80 miles away, just a little bit to the west, mainly south. They're going to be floated down in the Mediterranean Sea. They're going to be brought ashore in the only Israelite port city. The one of Joppa has a connection with Jonah later on as well. And then he says, you can transport them, you and your people, from that location up to Jerusalem. Remember, we're going south, but we're going up in elevation. This is some rugged terrain. And the distance between the two is about 40 miles. That's not going to be an easy haul, carrying all that timber up the mountainside. But that's what needs to take place. So he solicits, and he's able to secure help from Hiram, king of Tyre, and this construction project before too long can be underway. Verse 10, Then Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. So he has this plan in place with the king. Verse 11, And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat for his household and 20 cores of pressed oil. Thus Solomon gave to Hiram Year by year, this is annually what he's receiving. I don't speak in cores, and I'm going to assume that you don't either. So at what we're looking right here is 103,200 bushels of wheat. 103,200 bushels of wheat. Um, if you're wondering, well, what exactly is a, a bushel? 32 dry U.S. quarts as to what that uh, equivalates. And I want to say the cubic inches are like 2,100 something, if that helps any. So... That's a lot of, a lot of food. <laughs> and 1,100 gallons of beaten oil. 1,100 gallons of oil. Where do you think they're getting that oil? This isn't petroleum, right? What kind of oil we got here? The olives that have, have been harvested before they turn ripe. They're pressed. I want you to think about how many olives you're going to have to pick and press to get 1,100 gallons worth. Israel, of course, is very well known for the olive oil in that location. That's every year he's going to give to his household. I'm going to say that Hiram eats very well during this seven-year span between the wheat and the olive oil. Verse 12. Oh, I don't want to say this one, do it. Who wants to tell us our memory verse? Oh, wow. Look at those hands. Beautiful hands. Uh, Miss Autumn, go ahead. Well done. So the Lord gave wisdom to Solomon as he had promised. How much wisdom did he promise to give Solomon? That's the as, the degree to which. What is that? How much? Like, that's probably like 100,000 gallons worth. I'm talking about 50 bubble gums? I don't know. As much as necessary, yeah. He says, as much as anyone, or more than anyone has had before you, more than anyone who's ever going to come after you. <laughs> and so just like he promised, he pours, and, and that's been the whole thrust, and I hope that's been on full display in, in this section, is wisdom in politics and request of God, you know, going back to this very thing, and his judgment and, and those who are in his cabinet and his economic policies and the words that he speaks. We've seen in, in negotiation with foreign kings, and now we're going to see it on display here in the organization. God fulfills his promise, and man, do you see the wisdom of this gentleman pour out. 13, so Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel, and the labor force was 30,000 men. If you're a ruler, how do you just raise up a labor force, just create your own business of 30,000 people like that? How do you do that if you're a king, you think? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, we're, along those lines, right? We would probably call this a draft in the United States of America, I believe. And that seems to be what's occurring here. So he, he raises up a labor force out of all Israel of 30,000 men, and he sends them to Lebanon. I'll go back on our... Go ahead, you can come help me. 
I could use it. Everybody knows that. <laughs> uh, he sends them to Lebanon on our map, north, about 80 miles up. 10,000 a month in shifts. They were one month in Lebanon and two months back at home. So it's kind of like military service, really. Uh, and Adoniram was in charge of that labor force. How many times they go into work in Lebanon through the draft? This isn't the good, you're not getting paid millions, okay, to do this one, but. Okay, once a quarter, so four times a year, you're going to be going up and with your group. You're one month on, two months off. One month on, two months off, and you'll do that throughout this span. Well, now we're going to find out also in verse 15, Solomon had, so that's how many total back here we just learned? Back here? Pop quiz. 30,000. Okay, good. Now listen to this. Solomon had 70,000. Well, that's already beyond what we're talking. 70,000 who carried burdens. You think they might have been carrying some timber over those seven years? 70,000 who carried burdens. 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains. And that's besides, well, we'll get to that here in, in just a moment. So uh, it appears that that just in these 30,000 are Israelites, okay? Who are the 70,000 plus the 80,000? Bless you. And we're going to find out actually plus 3,300 and technically plus another 300 to get us to the 156 that we need. Who are these people, do you think? Any ideas? Go back to 1 Kings 9. Go ahead if you're thinking while we're turning there. Any, any thoughts? Okay, yeah, good. Good, John. These are slaves. That's not allowed among God's people, is it? On the inside. Now, if there's been battle and, you know, absorbed, and they were actually taught that in Deuteronomy 20 if we'd read on, which we didn't. But 1 Kings 9, verses 20 and 21. See if we can get some clarity here. All the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, basically these are a bunch of uh, parasites, who were not of the people of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel were unable to devote to destruction, these Solomon drafted to be slaves. And so they are to this day. But of the people of Israel, Solomon made no slaves. Now they're part of this draft process, but they're not the, you know, part of the, the forced uh, labor in terms of the, you know, the hard manual labor. They were the soldiers. They were the officials, his commanders, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. So that's the difference between the two. These are people that are left over. They never should have been there. <laughs> but they're put into slavery, and that was allowed under the law. Okay, so verse 15 of 1 Kings 5. Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens, plus 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains, besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies. And so if I'm counting right, what do, we, what do we have now? Total. 80,000, 70,000, and 50, plus 3,300. Oh, there's one column off. 153, right? Is that right? Okay, there we go. 153, 3. Does that sound right? I believe we are. Okay. And then you'll find it, uh, the parallel to that in 2 Chronicles 2. There's another 300 then. It mentions 3,600 that are over them. And it could be a situation where there's less earlier on, and then, okay, we need more, and so maybe more are brought in, which would make a lot of sense. These are the ones who supervise the people who labored in the work. Verse 17, And the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, hewn stones, to lay the foundation of the temple. Very quickly, I want to read from James Smith's commentary on this. He says, although the foundation stones would not be seen, equal care was given to their preparation. Ordinarily, plain stones were used in foundations. The king, however, ordered for the temple great, costly, hewn stones. Some of these very stones can be viewed, bless you, at the excavations on Mount Moriah today. And I'd like to show you, even today, this is one of the uh, tunnels where the quarrying of stones was done from the time period of Solomon. And in the side of the wall right here is a place where some of the actual stones were cut out to use in the construction of the temple. Of course, these have been located in modern excavations. Pretty cool stuff. 
So let's finish up with verse 18. So Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, and the Gebelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. In case you're wondering about the Gebelites, or the people of uh, Byblos from our map, uh, that's a Phoenician city also. It's about 20 miles north of modern Beirut. And we're told in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 27, that these are people who were known for their skill, uh, their know-how in construction. So it makes sense that their help would be solicited also. So that takes us through 1 Kings chapter 5. And I have good news for you. It's been all this preparatory work for building the temple. Excitement as it is at an all-time high in the nation of Israel. And next week we begin construction finally <laughs> in chapter 6 of 1 Kings. Please memorize, if you will, in addition to reading chapter 6, uh, please memorize verse 14. Super short, easy one, but it, it gets what we need to know from that chapter. So store that away. And as we close, I want you to think about this. We may discuss it some next week. Do you think there might be any connection that even though the stones of the foundation of the temple, most people would say in a structure like that, they're not important. Nobody's ever going to see them. He makes sure they're the nicest, most costly, elaborate stones to lay the foundation for God's temple. Do you think that might have any New Testament application? Let's be thinking about that for next week. Okay, appreciate the time.